This is Runehammer. RPG Talks. Design theory, Q&A, and counter methods, story building, DM deep thinking, and game building. It's all right here. So strap in, and may your dice roll high. Ho ho, I hate that moose sound you make at the beginning of your podcast. <laughs> I never thought of it as making a moose sound. Hey, greetings programs, it's Hanker and Furnail here, back once again, the lyrical master, the dungeon damager, P-Funk manager. I'm actually not the manager for P-Funk. I just made that up. Um, it's RPG Talks, guys. Welcome back. Let's do another one of these bad boys. First of all, thanks to all the patrons. Uh, November's been a little bit dense, so I haven't been getting as many stories down uh, in recorded form as I need to. So I'm just trying to get right back on the horse here. And we're going to do it with RPG Talks. Now, this is a burly one. We are We are neck deep in material on this one, so get comfy. And I uh, hope you're looking forward to an exciting week of life in the modern universe and in the world of the imagination, because that's what I'm going to do. And uh, today we're talking about um, the slow knife or how to boil a frog is the other title. It's basically a talk about the benefits of sort of taking it slow and working the details in your game. And then also, you guys know how RPG talks are. We need to take a look inside that old mailbag. So let's kick that cool mailbag song. Where's it at? Mailbag day, mailbag day. Let's go see what's in the mail today. There we go. All right. Today, we are talking about the TCC mailbag. As many of you guys know, I went down to the Tucson Comic Con last weekend. It was a, a huge experience. Met a lot of people and, the, and also um, took my first foray into sort of doing a panel or, you know, a talk at a convention. And, uh, wow, what an experience. I was, I just, I do not know what I'm doing, but at the same time, they went really well. One of them was really weird because I had a sort of a listing error in the brochure, but, uh, for the ones that were well described in the schedule, people showed up and, and knew what to expect and, uh, they went great. But here's the thing at the end of all my talks, I would do Q and a, and I got loads of questions and questions that weren't entirely unfamiliar from dungeon masters out there, you know, looking for solutions to tough problems and problems that never honestly really go away. I mean, you're trying to do a complex, nuanced, creative hobby. So and in a serial fashion, you know, ongoing, it's not like you run one D&D game and you're satisfied forever. Like it's it's always going to resurface that you're going to have these challenges. And a lot of people have those challenges. They're shared by all. So three uh, sort of qu key questions came up, and they came up more than once. And I, so I wanted to bring them into the mailbag, and so we, we're looking at our TCC mailbag. So the first one is, how do you overcome creative block, right? Writer's block or, you know, creative constipation, <laughs> as it's sometimes known. It's where you're, you're just not, it's not there, like... The urge to do it isn't there. The ability seems to have left you. The time is not around. You, it's just not happening. It's not like it's not that you're sitting down and doing it badly. That's a different problem. You're just not ever coming to the table. And how do you break this problem? Man, I tell you, this is a lifelong challenge. And you could be at any level of achievement, of skill, of accomplishment, and still be subject to the exact same forces as far as creative block. So the very first step with creative block is to see and acknowledge openly that it's going to happen to all people, to all creative people, and you don't need to feel embarrassed or wrong or weak or bad <laughs> because you're suffering a creative block. Even if it's a huge one, man, I've gone through some of them that can last months, months, I say. And if if your hobby is your favorite thing and months are passing where just nothing's coming out, you're just feeling sort of dry and cold and, <laughs> you know, rotted, it's a terrible, terrible feeling. But as long as you still keep believing and, and keep a bright attitude and be honest about yourself and stuff, it, it will come back around. That doesn't really answer the question. The question is how? How does it come back around? How can I pull out of this funk? 
Okay, the first step is to just admit that it's nothing wrong, that it just happens to everybody. Okay, that's the first step. The second is just like everything that is built slowly over time, the big key is just to show up. The key is just to arrive. So even if you're not feeling it, to sit down and keep those muscles warm. So a good way to do it is to try journaling. Now, not the cool kind of journaling where you're drawing all these cool maps and coming up with neato stuff. And No, that's when you're in your creative mode. When you're out of your creative mode, you can just keep a Google Doc and just type in your journal each day and just describe what's going on. And, and this is all part of naming your evil, right? You, you guys have probably heard about this technique, which is like, once you, you give a thing a name and pull it out into the light and expose it, it loses a lot of its power. But if you leave it in the darkness, it, it has this sort of power over you. But the minute that you pull what's wrong out and say, oh, look, looks like I'm in one of these dang dry spells. Well, here's what's going through my head today concerning that. And, and write it down. The fact that you're just showing up to write, that you're being introspective, that you're still you're still alive, you're still breathing, you're still kicking. That That's a big part of the process that's going to loosen those muscles up and it's going to return. Another technique that can be tried is this sort of bite-sized technique. A lot of times creative block can happen because your mind wants to jump ahead and not only see and predict and enjoy all of the steps that are going to come after the beginning, but then it's overwhelmed by all of those steps. So it's like, I'm going to make a campaign. This is the most common one I hear. I'm going to make a campaign. I sit down. I had a really cool idea. And then I start thinking about all the stuff I need to do. And before I know it, I've wandered off and I'm like having a cheese sandwich, right? The technique that you can use to avoid this is to do bite-sized creativity. And there's a couple ways to do bite size. One is by content which is like, okay, I'm only going to design one little encounter and then I'm just going to step away. Even if I'm still excited, I'm going to walk away and rest a little bit and do something else. Okay. The other one way to do it is by time. Okay. So I'm only going to goof around with this for 20 minutes and we kind of see if anything happens for 20 minutes. And then I'm going to take at least 20 minutes to go do the dishes or walk the dog. And this bite sized technique can keep you fresh as well as slowly start to train you to avoid, okay, I've got 12 hours of work to do this campaign and I'm going to begin right now. Oh boy, I'm going to go make some cereal. <laughs> so the idea is to split up these big tasks into smaller bite sizes. And if you don't know what's ahead and you're just wanting to be creative in a free form way, the bite size technique can work too because you get that freshness. And so even if you're not getting what you want out of your creativity. You're showing up and over time showing up just like the gym or like being a parent or being a good friend. You're not any of, of those things in one quick session. You're those things over long periods of time. And I hate to give you such a difficult answer, but there it is. Creative block is not something you're going to be free of. It's something that you're going to learn to work with over time. So I hope that that answer is useful for you guys. And it's a comparable answer to what I gave uh, at the con. And it was a, a sort of teenage girl. She was probably 18 or so who asked it. And, you know, it's tough to give those like sort of real and honest answers rather than to be able to just say, oh, here's how you fix creative block. You need this certain pen. <laughs> I wish I could give that answer, but that's just not realistic. The next one here is... How do I build my campaign and my game overall to feel sandboxy and to feel free and open, but not wind up making this huge world that winds up sort of unexplored and, and, and try to account for all these possible branches? And how do I not go crazy being a DM, but have a little bit of sandbox? This is kind of the question, you know, and how do I blend it with, you know, sometimes I want my adventures to be, you know, like a water slide, but I always want that sandboxy feeling. How do I get this? How, how do I, I hear people talk about it, but honestly, I've never really seen it executed well. How can I get a little bit of freedom, but a little bit of story and how can I make that happen? Wow. This is a probably the single most asked question that I ever get this and stuff about like problem players. This one it is a lot easier to answer, I think, than something like Creative Block. This one is simply a matter of 
how and when you present choice to your players. The, the art of creating choice is something that I would wager almost all dungeon masters are excellent at. They have a sense of branches. Maybe they're familiar with it from novels, from choose your own adventure books, or from video games. They're familiar with the concept, the tone, and what makes choice for players fun and intriguing and bend the story in interesting ways. I think a lot of people are really good at that instinct. I think where they stumble a little bit is when to integrate those choices into the game itself in, in a practical fashion. Now, I think the <clears throat> the most common mistake is to integrate these choices into every step of the game, into character creation, into session zero, into the beginning, halfway through the dungeon, when we rest, you know, we're, if we're going to grow food halfway through a dungeon, all that stuff. And then at the end of the session, well, we're also going to do this and that, right? Just this, it's over choice, right? Now, players will never call you on it. They'll be like, darn it, I'm so tired of making all these cool choices. <laughs> no, they're going to have fun with it. Your job as the dungeon master is to provide this sort of lane for them to play in. And sometimes the lane is wide and sometimes the lane is narrow. And, and this concept of a lane is going to give you some, some peace as, as a DM. And you want to narrow this almost all the time except the end of a session and sometimes between sessions. So what you don't want to do is prepare a fun game let your friends come over, and then before the Cheetos are even gone, they are derailing and heading left where you were hoping they would go right because you planted this clue. They didn't pick up on the clue, or they don't care, and then they wanted to kill the mayor of the town, and you never even wanted to get into that whole mayor storyline and all this kind of stuff. That's what you don't want to do because it will undo your prep. It'll make you go crazy. You'll start to resent the players for, like, short-circuiting your content and so on and so forth, right? The remedy here is that at the end of the session and a little bit between, you can just openly say, hey, you guys, you know, I want you to, I want to give you some choice here in this area, but not over in this area. I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm good to go over there. But, you know, you guys kind of have these sort of three to four branches. So what are you guys thinking for next game? Oh, well, we're kind of interested in, you know, the, the wagon tracks, or we're kind of interested in that crazy chef that we met who ran off into the mountains. We're going to go chase him. Okay, cool. So then as the dungeon master, you go write the crazy chef game night, right? Which is this little adventure. And when everyone shows up, you jump right into that. Your lane is extremely narrow. And then toward the end of the adventure, as you're kind of coming out of your prepared portion, your lane can slowly and gently widen. And if you've got a good development of world and you're kind of ready as a dungeon master, that lane can open all the way up into sort of a field. And they can have complete freedom because it's the end of the session. So the prep now is going to be between their new decisions and your next game, not during or before. You see what I'm saying? So the way that you control the sandbox versus the water slide is, is when you apply and allow it. That is the fundamental skill. Now, there's a bunch of other stuff involved in, you know, creating a world that's conducive to sandboxing. You know, where there are places to go and things to do that that are choosable. And what we can talk about it another time. It's a pretty big topic. But really, you're going to rely on your sort of bullet method in your journal. If you've got bullets for the available choices and branches, then you'll, you'll be somewhat prepared at least to propose those choices. If players come up with a choice that you hadn't imagined, no need to panic because it's end of session. So you make a couple of notes on what they want to do. They want to go pursue this chef into the mountains, which you have zero prep on. And you're going to, you know, make sure you understand that area, have a little bit of encounters ready and who this chef is and his name and so on and so forth. Right. So that's the answer that I gave at the con. Not an easy thing to give off the cuff, you know, in a live environment with it must have been about 70 people there. Um, but uh yeah, it seemed like we, we reached a copacetic understanding. <laughs> so I hope that answer helps you guys, this concept of a lane and, and when you apply and allow choice. Okay, the next one was from a couple guys in the front row on my left uh, who basically have a group in which they have one member whose alignment is counter to everyone else. So I think they have like a lawful evil, they might have said. But basically, you guys know this problem. It comes up a lot. They have an evil-aligned 
character in their group. And the player, I think, is sort of using that evil alignment as a kind of a shelter for some counter group behavior. So their question was, how do we resolve this? Oof. You guys know my answer on this one. It comes up a lot. And uh, in this case, it was very specific because it was all about alignment. I actually think this group wants to play together, but they couldn't resolve the alignment thing. So my answer is the same as it usually is, which is that this isn't something that can be resolved in the normal game session. This has to be resolved through just an awkward, honest moment where you have to say, dude, and I open this discussion to the table. I think this like evil alignment thing is just not good for the group. And we can just switch the alignment on your character would probably be the best because he's a cool character. And it's just end this sort of endless conflict or let's just bag the character, come up with a new one. And if not that, then we might just need to maybe think, take a break from the group. Or maybe I'm just going to take a break and think about how to deal with this. You know, just basically you're speaking as a person, not just as the dungeon master, not just as the game persona. And I really think this is the only solution to this stuff because it's being taken to that sort of personal human level. So in order to resolve it, you need to take it to that personal human level. I mean, it's it, this is the toughest answer to give. But, you know, this game is bad. <laughs> if you're in a game with this problem... You, you deserve better. You, you don't need to be subject to this kind of odd, passive-aggressive abuse. And uh, if you guys are all evil and it's a romp and stuff like that, then that's fine. And if, the, if there's evil and good in a group and there's conflict that's interesting and fun and everyone's enjoying it because it's spinning the story, that's great too. But if it's just conflict and just, you know, a stick in the mud, you know, sort of a rock in the river. <laughs> How many metaphors are there? Lots of them. Anyways, so that's my answer. If you guys are dealing with that, it, I, I extend my best wishes to you because it's never easy, especially when friendship's involved and so forth. I had a little bit of a piece of mail from myself into the mailbag, and, and that creative block question really struck home to me. Um, not only because creative block, but because I actually just wanted in this podcast to extend uh, as best I can... Um, this sort of feeling of encouragement and of strength as you're confronting your creative challenges. And I think the reason I want to extend that, like, you can do it, man, woman. The reason I want to do that is that I'm having a tough go of it at the moment, too. I, I have, like, too many changes happening in life all at the same time, and, and it, it makes good, stable, sit-down creativity, very, very difficult. And so I have all these plates spinning on the end of sticks, right, with my creative output. I love to tell stories. I love to think about fantasy. I love to think about emotional, sort of mythic fantasy. I love to have people over to play. Um, I love to put encounters up on YouTube. I love to sort of muse about awesome creative seeds that come in the form of, you know, little known books and other things on YouTube and on the podcast and with my friends. And I have this ravenous appetite for all this stuff, right? But without that kind of sit down concentration, it's hard to keep all the plates spinning. You know, you, you find yourself writing a little less, you find yourself playing a little less, you find yourself doing less research and sort of you know, sitting, looking at the backyard <laughs> for long moments or like, you know, watching TV or something. And um, I'm not really used to to that kind of difficulty. But my, my creative output has been, even for me, at the extreme level since about May. And uh, I think that I'm just sort of being human. And uh <laughs> I guess what I wanted to put into the podcast is just like, it, it's okay. Like, it's okay to do that. It's okay to have that difficulty. If, if everyone could do it all the time with extreme awesomeness, it wouldn't be a, as satisfying as, as a hobby as it is. If, if it was just everyone was creative and like the stories were always cool and the, the boards and the terrain were always fun and your groups were always perfect and oh, right. It just wouldn't be the creative challenge that I think draws people to this hobby, which is that they like to expand and press their skill sets. And they, they like to try new things and dream into places that they don't know if they're 
equipped to go to those places. And uh, so I guess I just wanted to, you know, give this kind of hoorah type message to everybody out there listening, you know, and Lord knows I get that same message in return from you guys um, and everyone out there in the Runehammer community. And uh, it's absolutely fantastic. So I just want to remind you, mantra, power words. I can do it. It's okay. And if I can't do it today, that's okay too. I can try again tomorrow. And like, that's all right. It's all right. Just let it happen. Let it flow. So that is mailbag for RPG Talks uh, for today. And uh, kind of a burly, rambling mailbag. But, uh, you know, these are really thoughtful topics that strike home for me. And uh, so I always try to go as far as I can. If you guys have specific stuff that you want to throw in the mailbag, um, please don't hesitate to throw me a, a private message. Um, comments on Patreon are a little harder to keep track of than emails or private messages. Um but, uh, you know, I try to make sure I, I read and see and respond to every single thing. So that's the mailbag for today. Let's be, let's get that music and get the heck out of this mailroom. Smells weird in here. Mailbag day, mailbag day. Let's go see what's in the mail today. Okay. Okay, let me pull this chair up and get cozy here. So the real topic of RPG Talks today, and I believe this is episode six, is the slow knife. So as many of you uh, Dune fans out there know, this phrase comes from the slow knife penetrates the shield, right? They have these personal shields, and if you just hack at it, you bounce off of it. But if you slowly press the knife through, it'll penetrate the energy, and you can you can slay your foe, right? The other title to the talk that I gave it was How to Boil a Frog. So if you're familiar with that saying, um, you know, a boiling a frog is like, I guess, and I don't know. I don't know if this is real or anyone has ever tried this, but supposedly you can boil a frog and the slow lift in temperature in the water, it like doesn't notice. And then suddenly it's like dead, <laughs> which is just freaking awful. If you think about it, <laughs> it's just terrible. But anyway, the message is the same as the slow knife, which is that sometimes the maximum effect can be achieved with this very slow technique. And so what I wanted to offer today was some tips and thoughts on how to bring this into your game and why you should even be considering bringing it in, uh, into your game. So that's the first thing is, is what are you talking about, Hankerin? Uh, what do you mean slow knife? What are you saying? Usually you say just jump right in and, you know, get into the combat and stuff like that, right? Well, yes, always do that. But as far as the nuance of your game goes, it will behoove you to leap into simple situations, human situations, for quite some time in a campaign before you dive into the crazier stuff. And the reason that you want to try to do this is the impact of the crazy stuff is part one. And part two is the game is all about team cohesion and the nuance of the characters and how they relate to each other you're going to find deeper and more satisfying realms of that cohesion and that nuance by allowing the players a little bit of simplicity and slowly moving towards something intense. So a good counterexample might seem like the dragon encounter that I proposed from Dark Sun, right? The first encounter of the entire campaign, there's a dragon. But... If you look at the mechanics and the detail of that encounter, it's actually extremely simple and there's very little to it. It's really just a sort of a walk up to some wrecked wagons and run for your life. That really is the encounter. It's just couched in some excitement. A series of simple and human encounters like this that chain together before you really get into even like a sort of a big dungeon are gonna give you this slow boil effect, right? It's like short mission, short mission, short mission, talking with NPCs, a little bit of rest there, short mission, now let's go off on the big mission, okay? That, that would be a version of the slow boil, and that would occur over the course of maybe six weeks' time. Now, I'm sort of on about this topic right now because it's exactly what we're doing in the Ghost Mountain campaign. We kept it really simple. I mean, all we needed to do was sort of travel, and then all we needed to do was kind of get to know the people in this town and then go up to these woods and do a little thing and then go over to this place and do a little thing. And 
we're just sort of getting little crumbs of adventure here and there. And then finally, not finally, but you know where we're at now, we went into our first sort of big dungeon where it's getting a little crazier and a little more like what you're used to in tabletop. But we've been through so much already together that that context is there, that nuance between the players. And so the dungeon is so much more interesting and so much more fun. So my first tip for, let, let's just assume that you believe me, that this is worth doing. <laughs> like it is, it is really fun way to do your next campaign is to try this slow ramp up towards something really cool. Okay. And, you know, it's a classic technique of low fantasy. You know, Lord of the Rings is a perfect example of it. You know, it, it brings you all the way down from, you know, like cheese and bread at Bilbo's house all the way up to, you know, the slopes of Mount Doom at the end. And uh, that to me is, is a good example of how it goes from the small and up and up. And their relationships are what make those big conflicts at the end so fascinating. So little things to do to get the most out of this technique. The first one, I have a bullet here, says who, not what. And, and what this uh, means is that the campaign is all about the characters, who they are, how they interrelate, and how they relate to the world. It's about the who of the story. And then the what can come second. <clears throat> the what would be, they need to go find and capture the, the black ostrich of Mugglebunk, right? They need to go and uh, uncover the relic that's lost in the woods. Then they need to help this guy, you know, get his wagon out of the rut. And then they need to find, uh, you know, the snake scales of Banguli, which have been lost in the swamp. Okay, that's what. You probably have ideas for what coming out of the wazoo because you are a dungeon master. But the who, it isn't even really just the character descriptions or classes. It's, it's the actions and words that those characters have said to each other. It's the relationships, the nuance, the grudges, the, 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 great, the gratefulness, <laughs> gratitude. The revenge, the, the, the spite, it's all these little nuanced relationship pieces that are the focus of a slow boil campaign. It's the who of the story, not the what. Next one is try chapter-based sandboxing. So what this means is that for this chapter of the game, I actually have five possible little short threads that the players can pursue. And they, they don't need to go in a particular order. They can go in any order. Um, but they all kind of loosely connect to the story or what I perceive the story to be. And once this chapter is sort of resolved, we're going to move to the next chapter. And that one has three separate little choices that also kind of go in their own way. And then what you're going to do is stop writing right there because you don't know how it's going to play out and you want to adapt. So the more you write, the more grumpy you're going to be because it doesn't play out the way you thought it was. <laughs> but each chapter is a sandbox in itself, just a small one. A good example of a small sandbox that everybody's probably done is the sort of uh, tavern billboard technique, right? You start the campaign with a tavern billboard. The billboard has like three wanted posters on it for lack of a cooler idea. And the players can do those in any order and they don't affect each other that much. But as you play those three wanted posters out, you start to find fun seeds of the story going further, unresolved bits or clues or hints of a bigger situation and stuff like that. A lot of Dungeon Masters have done this technique. But once that chapter's concluded and they move on sort of to the next town or to the dungeon, to the ruined castle, that one has its own three little branches that can be tried by the players in any order with any kind of configuration. But then in the third chapter, there's one big thing to do and there's no way out and it's intense. Okay, that, that's your kind of your formula. So try chapter-based sandboxing. Uh, it's a great way to give enough freedom to your game where players are choosing things, but not so much that you're going crazy. Okay, next one is employ conditions. This is the, the precept that Torchbearer is written upon. Conditions are what Torchbearer is all about. During Torchbearer play, every four rounds, you take on a new condition, like hungry, angry, scared, uh, poor, wealthy, afraid, whatever, sweating, sick. Ongoing conditions in this kind of campaign are useful because they will create kinship. Now, what do I mean by that? 
just getting hurt and then healing up your HP doesn't really require fellowship or trust or friendship or support from your teammates. You kind of get hurt, you heal up, you're good to go. You get hurt, you heal up, you're good to go. Hey, this is fun. Okay, see you next week. But if you break a leg and now your character is really slow until that dang leg heals, or you've had a curse put on you, or you're in, in our case, we had this sort of, we were dead. We were walking dead for a while, and we had to find a way to, to cure ourselves of, of being undead. Or maybe you've, you've, you have lycanthropy in your group, or maybe one of you is a, a vampire, or, or one of you has fallen terribly ill, you know? Or even something extreme like paralysis, like the Three-Eyed Raven in Game of Thrones, and you have to sort of be pulled around in a cart for a few adventures and stuff like this. These things aren't terribly pleasant. They're generally in the realm of the unpleasant, but the realm of the unpleasant is where friendships grow deeper. This is where the, the real kinship of your team is going to start to emerge. And so my suggestion in the slow boil campaign is to employ some lasting conditions that even some of them require small offshoot quests to resolve. And they don't affect everyone in the party evenly because, you know, things are going to play out in their own interesting way. But you can employ conditions to build this deeper camaraderie in your group. For more on conditions, definitely look up uh, Torchbearer and uh, have a look at how they do it because it's really, really neat and it, it makes things very, very human. And I know for me, it, it really upped my game a little bit reading through how they do conditions. Next, I have what I call the small town boomerang. The small town boomerang is basically where you choose a central location and your players do small quests or tasks or missions or sort of arms of story out from that central location and then they return to it. Then they go out and they do another thing and then they return and then they go out and they return. And, and the way that this is useful to you in the slow boil is that you can slowly change the town slightly as the players are doing what they do. You can improve or worsen the town. You can tell some very small stories about some of the people in the town, a couple of NPCs that are vivid enough to see over time. It also just gives the players a sort of an investment in this little town. And as the campaign gets crazier and bigger, they're always going to have that home time to think of, like back in the day, you know, back when we used to be in the little town. <laughs> and now we're in these castles and on, flying on griffins and stuff. But, you know, we really just want to go back to that town and have, you know, one of, one of you know, Aunt Belle's apple pies. <laughs> So consider the small town boomerang technique. It's definitely sort of part of your chapter-based sandboxing approach. Okay, next I have this kind of rhythm bullet that I think is useful. And the, the rhythm goes like this. Comfort to peril to comfort to doom. Okay, now what, what exactly does that mean? This is a very boiled down summary of your campaign. So they're comfortable you know, things aren't that scary. And then there's peril. Okay, there's a little bit of scare, but then they come back to the comfort and then they go out and they discover much bigger, darker forces. Now, this rhythm can play out in any number of adventures. So it could literally be one, two, three, four, or it could be one, two, three, four, five, one, two, one, two, three, one. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's a lot of different ways you can spin it, but that rhythm is the magic, is that we're comfortable, we're small time, we're human. Okay, whoa, we got into a little bit of danger, we got into some peril, but we came through it in one piece, and now we're going to go back. Okay, ah, we're cozy again, we're safe. Oh, wait, we need to go do this other thing? Okay, we're going to do that, and then, oh, much larger, darker, more powerful truth revealed. Ah, why bother with this rhythm? It's this yo-yoing effect. Now, anyone who's ever been through sort of trials and tribulations in their real life knows that to just go from sort of being happy and comfortable into being, you know, say stressed or, or under duress, that transition is, is actually manageable. But then to yo-yo back into being comfortable and happy again, and then descend back further down, that that sort of roller coaster is what it's commonly described at in a negative sense. That is where 
more tension and uncertainty will build. Now, in real life, you don't want tension and uncertainty <laughs> by any means. But in an adventure story, in a campaign, it's exactly the sort of the substance of what you're building with as a dungeon master. So you're going to yo-yo their emotions a little bit. Now, you can't do it so much that they become wary or guarded but you need to do it just enough so that they don't just feel like, yes, long ago we were uh, level one adventurers, and then we did a bunch of things, and now we're level five. And uh, yes, it's going quite well. And now we're level 10, and it's all going to plan. No, 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 no. Rise and fall. Live and die. Like tragedy and triumph. And, and work that yo-yo just right. And it's going to depend on your players. It's going to depend on you. It's going to depend on how the story's going, but consider the rhythm. And so if you look back at your previous adventure and it was sort of a comfort moment, then it's time to plunge. If you look back and the last one was this harrowing ordeal, then it might be time to, to lift up. One thing that is great at this rhythm are some of the old um, pixel RPGs like Chrono Trigger or Final Fantasy III if you played any of that kind of stuff, they had this fantastic rhythm of battles and sort of town or rest time um, that would grow increasingly crazy over time. You would be stuck in the field longer and longer. And man, you would really treasure seeing that little pixel bed when you eventually did. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Next up is probably my favorite bullet in this huge discussion of the slow boiling campaign. My, my favorite thing and probably the, you know, the real meat and potatoes of my DMing style, um, especially in this Ghost Mountain campaign that we're doing right now, which is the art of loose ends. The art of loose ends is you having the confidence and the relaxation as a dungeon master to let clues and little uh, sort of hooks just form themselves on accident without knowing what they are. So in, in our, just to make this specific, I'll give you a great specific example. In our campaign, um, the characters needed to go up to this burial ground, supposedly to try to find a way to cure their undead condition. They get there and something's wrong with this burial ground. It's sort of been hexed in some way and the ground opens up and it's this huge toothy mouth in the earth with all these tortured souls down in there and it's growing like it's going to engulf this whole place. It starts eating rocks and all this. It's crazy. And we had a couple of the characters fall in and they found this hexed mummified sort of corpse and they removed the hex and this great big mouth with these jagged teeth slowly, slowly closed in the ground. And it was kind of like, what the hell was that? Now, when I ran the encounter, I didn't know what that was. I just sort of was going with it, and, and I, I knew that that would be a sort of a novel concept. But the player's reaction to it was they were convinced that this was a sign of some deeper truth, and I, I couldn't agree more. Like, there, was, there, was, there had to be a reason that this huge mouth was opening in this burial ground. There had to be more to this. This is something happening to the world, sort of, right? And after the session, I started thinking about what it was. And now that's sort of one of the central threads of our story. But the art of the loose end is letting those clues just occur with no planning of what they're going to be. And then between sessions, playing on those details and weaving them into your story. You guys have probably often experienced this with NPCs, right? You, you introduce a seemingly meaningless NPC, you know, the fruit vendor at the edge of town and just because of player actions and shenanigans, he winds up being like a central character that everybody really cares about. And, oh, wait, no, he's probably actually a part of the secret alliance and all this kind of stuff. Right, right? The art of the loose end is basically your ability to go, oh, yeah, maybe he is part of the secret alliance. Yeah, the whole fruit vendor thing is just a cover. Oh, yeah, cool. Okay, I'm just going to run with that. But you didn't know that when you first introduced him. You literally just wanted a guy there to like scream and run away when the Dark Lord appeared, right? <laughs> but he actually became this story thread. And that's the art of the loose end. It's, it's introducing things in your game that in the moment just seem cool for their own sake. And then letting meaning and gravity be assigned almost arbitrarily to those things and just running with it. Just let the loose ends just fray. 
And there might be five or six of them. You don't even know where some of them are going, and maybe they're never even pursued. But you just let them happen, and your group can decide which ones to pursue between sessions or at the end of a session. So I love doing the loose ends. I'm a huge fan of it, riffing on player assumptions and and letting myself create in the moment. It's kind of like uh, my motto that withdrawing, your hand knows what to do even if your head doesn't. And, and this is the same. Your group knows what to do in your campaign. The moment knows what to do, even though planning it out, you might stumble a bit. So embrace those loose ends. My next one to do this sort of slow boil technique is to consider having a lot less NPCs in your world that like have names and, and are people. And in return, give them more depth. So instead of eight NPCs in your town with names who have little micro stories, do one NPC in your town and everyone else is murmuring in the background. (laughs) There's only one Waldo, right? And so you fully embrace Waldo. Waldo has some family troubles. You know, he's lived in the town a long time. He's seen things come and go, you know, and, and he's... He actually sort of maybe has some guilt or there's a reason that he can't go do the adventures himself and he, he's troubled by this. Or This is going to give you this effect of intimacy and nuance. And I don't think I even really need to say much about this because it's such a simple thing to try and apply. And if it doesn't work for you, then bring back your whole cast. But my guess is that you will, you'll find meaningful relationships occurring between this NPC and your players. And, and, you know, as you well know as a dungeon master, a relationship between a character and an NPC is like solid gold as far as driving the story. You can do so many things with that. And so my suggestion to try to find that solid gold to reduce the quantity of NPCs and really up the depth. Okay, so we only have two more bullets here. The next one is... Consider putting your big revelation beyond the fifth session. Now, this is another very nuts and boltsy type suggestion. This isn't like esoteric at all or hard to apply. This is very directly worded, right? So you don't need to plan when that's going to happen. All you know is it's not going to happen until time X, right? Maybe you guys are doing, you know, a Tiamat thing. You're going after Tiamat. Well, you don't even get a hint of Tiamat until after the fifth session. It's just a really hard and simple rule. You don't even like know where to go to find him or if he's even real until after the fifth session. Now, how do you make sure that that happens? Well, you stick to the previous tips. You know, you do the small town boomerang. You you work with an NPC. You do some low-level tasks for townsfolk and you kind of stay comfortable a little bit before you really dare to discover the truth of what Tiamat really is. Maybe Tiamat is actually just a sort of a front put on by an evil sorcerer. And you not only discover this, but locate. And so on that sixth or seventh session, you're going to go investigate. And now you're talking about like the big part of your campaign. And this spirals right into my final bullet, which is that As this big reveal happens at your sort of sixth or seventh session, you're going to twist the knife in your characters with nostalgia. This is where all of your work and all of your patience in coming up in the small town life with your characters and your players is now suddenly useful. And it's a classic mechanism. And, you know, Tolkien, of course, is a master of it, right? What, what? do um, Frodo and Sam think about when they're on the slopes of Mount Doom at the very end? Like, hooray, we've saved the world? No. They reminisce about, like, strawberries and cream back in the Shire. Because suddenly those simpler times seem so dang fantastic. So as your players are facing down this evil sorcerer who has conjured this illusion of Tiamat to sort of, you know, up his standing or to scare off his opponents or whatever... As they're going through this hellish battle in this crazy dungeon, and maybe there's a a mind flayer that's controlling this sorcerer and making him more powerful than he should be, and there's these horrors, and the characters are just eyeballs deep in in the fear. Suddenly, back in the day, when all they needed to do was, you know, rustle up some magic potatoes so that they could, you know, heal the sick boy in the village, they seem really great. And your job as as the dungeon master in that instance is to remind them of those great little details, to remind them of the nostalgia and, and twist the knife a little bit. And by twisting the knife, 
I mean, give your campaign that substance. You know, take time and have the courage, as the dungeon master, to tell some nuanced bits to the story, rather than just the huge battles and the terror and the dungeon tunnels, right? But those are the perfect place to tell these little nuanced stories, is in ultimate danger and darkness. And how can you do this? Well, you can have your villain know about their simpler roots, and he can indirectly or even directly sort of twist that weakness in them. You know, it's a classic to take a hostage from the little town or to put visions of the little town burning in their heads. You know, that's another Tolkien uh, gem. But if this nostalgia takes hold in your players, you're going to have levels of of nuance and emotional investment that are just going to be fantastic. And that's what you're putting in all this extra time to achieve. So that's all the bullets that I wrote down for uh, the slow knife. And I I invite you guys not only to, to try some of these things or give them some thought in your game, but also, you know, do you have more bullets to add on this technique? You know, have you done something in your campaign or in an upcoming game that that accomplishes some of this stuff. And there's a deeper conversation here about, you know, why? Why would you do all this kind of stuff? And for me, especially right now, I'm looking to to delve a little further into the sub-layers of my campaigns. You know, the last big one that I ran, uh, you know, what, about a year ago now, it's some time has passed. <laughs> it was a two-year campaign, but it was really uh, pretty pulpy, you know, lots of big action and big adventure and stuff like that. And then coming from that over to Ghost Mountain, Ghost Mountain is so much smaller scale and so much more human. And, uh, you know, you can really feel the sort of the, the soil in your fingers of that world. And uh, for me as a storyteller and as a player, it's really felt rewarding and really fun and i'm enjoying it so that's why i wanted to put this talk together and share it all with you guys here on rpg talk so i hope that this is interesting and useful to you guys but also that it can start your own inner conversation or discussion with your group about how and why this kind of approach in a campaign could be interesting and lead to fun new places. And it doesn't have to be the beginning of a campaign to embrace this. You can you can kind of bring the humanity and the detail and the nuance at any time in a campaign. And so I invite you to give it a try and see if the, the dividends feel as cool to you as they do to me. All right, everybody, I am going to get the heck out of here. Um, I've got the next Burning in New Haven coming up, and I need to put the finishing touches on that. So look forward to that. Thank you again, everybody, all you patrons. Um, you guys make my my ongoing creative struggles and successes and failures possible, and uh, I can't thank you enough. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. This is RPG Talks on Runehammer, and I will catch you next time for some more epic stories, okay? Strength, my friends. Strength.